السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praise is due to Allah We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leaves us say None can show him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of Ask Huda And here is a quick reminder with our phone numbers and the contact informations Area code 002, then 023855 Area code 002, then 01005469323. WhatsApp numbers, area code 0013478026125. And finally, WhatsApp number, area code 0013614891503. You can follow us and watch us live on the Facebook page M Salah Official and on the YouTube channel uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah, which I uh, hope inshallah you will remember to subscribe to the YouTube and share the episode and all our programs inshallah. Without any further ado, the first question is from Sister Hayat. Hayat says, can I name my son Malik? A lot of people tell me not to two because it is not one of all it is one of Allah's names um, when we say a name is haram or halal it must be backed up with a reference or a proof what is haram is what the Prophet وسلم, stated it is forbidden to call a person by the name Malikul Mulk or the owner of the dominion because Malikul Mulk is only the Almighty Allah. So the King of Kings, likewise, is forbidden. But Malik is a name, even though it is one of the names of the angels, but the vast majority of the Muslim scholars are of the view that it is permissible to name your son after any of the names of the angels. The only Imam who has a different view, and it is based on a weak hadith is Imam Malik and it is quite interesting because Imam Malik himself his name is Malik so he is of the view that it is uh, disliked or makruh to name your son after any of the angels but the correct view due to the fact that this reference is weak it is okay to name your son or yourself any of the names of the angels uh, Jibreel, Mikael or Malik and as you know that Malik uh, is the name of the angel who is the guard of hellfire and his name is mentioned in the Quran وَقَالُوا يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَكِثُوا So bottom line or the conclusion it is permissible to name your son after any of the names of the angels بارك الله فيكم and the second question is uh, from Jiba Nisa Jiba says, I'm from Bangladesh. My father died last December. Please pray for him. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And I hope every time that we have somebody who is uh, wishing for a dua and we make dua for him, the viewers also by saying Ameen, you have actually prayed uh, for him or her or them. As a daughter, what can I do for him? He died after four months of my marriage. So is any hidad? that tells a father brought her daughter and get her married uh, Jannah will be wajib for him uh, yeah there are a hadith uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if Allah blessed or ibtala or tested a person by having four daughters three daughters two daughters and in one hadith he said one and in one incident the companion said had we asked him for one he would have said Yes, فَأَحْسَنَ تَرْبِيَتَهُنَّ So he brought them up very well. He taught them the deen. 
he taught them what need to be taught until they grew up so his daughters or his daughter whom he brought up properly and rightly will be a screen and a veil for him against hellfire. Yeah, that will prevent him from entering Annah. This is as far as if there is a hadith in this uh, respect. As far as your duties towards uh, your late father, when somebody loses a parent or parents, his duties towards them do not cease by their death. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, somebody asked him that I was very dutiful to my parents when they were living, now they're dead. Uh, do I still have to do anything in order to be dutiful to them? He said, yes. Upholding the ties which they used to hold whenever they were living. Not only the relatives that you visit them and you check on them, but also their friends, if they used to have good friends. So every now and then you call them, you check on them, you visit them, you take gifts for them. This is min al bir. This is how you honor your parents after their death. If they owed any debt, you should settle it. And the debt is not only in money or in cash or properties or material, but also if you know that your dad or your mom owed some fasting and they didn't make it up before their death, uh, or they had a nazr and it was not fulfilled, a vow, then it is your duty to do that. And then add dua ulahuma to make lots of dua for them. And the Quran teaches us how Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, used to supplicate and invoke Allah. So he says, So one should invoke Allah the Almighty on a regular basis with the maghfirah, forgiveness, with the pardon, with the mercy for his parents, whether they are living or uh, they are late. May Allah have mercy on those who passed away and uh, make their graves, gardens of paradise. Kanis Sayyida is asking, what can I do on my part if I see some of my close relatives just not being regular in prayer? I mean, can you please explain about the concept of Ruqya and whether it's uh, effective over a person who is not regular in prayer? These are two different questions. The first one is concerning our duties towards uh, those who are Muslims, but they don't pray, they don't pray on a regular basis. Uh, we are commanded to give da'wah to Muslims and to non-Muslims. And to Muslims who are not practicing, and Muslims who are not regular in practicing uh, the deen. And it is the duty of every Muslim to observe the concept of enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil, everyone within their capacity. Then when it becomes uh, a, a case of a relative, it becomes more emphasized to take care of it because the Quran says that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was commanded in Surah Al Shu'ara as follows وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ One should pay attention to his family members, to his relatives, in respect of advising them, enjoining them to what is good, forbidding them against the evil before giving da'wah to outsiders. They are more worthy, of course. So what we need to do is kindly remind them that Allah the Almighty, the Creator, the Provider, the Sustainer, the one who, whenever we fall ill, whenever we are in trouble, we turn unto Him asking for help. He is the one who is the Provider and the Sustainer, and He is the one who demanded us to pray on a regular basis, not because he benefits out of that, rather because it benefits us. قال عز من قائل in Surah النساء chapter number four إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا. So the prayer was ordained on the believers to be offered on fixed times. So there is a prayer time. There is a, a timetable for the prayers, and each prayer must be offered on its fixed time. In order to be connected 
to your Creator in order to supplicate and communicate with Him. And if you don't do that, and if you die in this condition, you're taking the risk of dying as a non-Muslim. It's as simple as that. This is not a joke. This is not something simple. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ said, العهد الذي بيننا وبينهم الصلاة فمن تركها فقد كفر and I think last week we had similar questions a husband who doesn't pray a family member who doesn't pray so if the person still refuses to pray then he chooses to be non-Muslim may Allah guide him and all of us to what is best السلام عليكم شكيل from France السلام عليكم السلام عليكم شيخ وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, my name is Shkiel and I am from France currently. Okay. Uh, and I have basically two questions. W one question is, uh, for example, when we travel, for example, suppose if we travel during the month of Ramadan, do we have to fast or we can like, is it compulsory to fast or we cannot fast? Suppose if we fast, it, will it be the against to the like the will it be against to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or should we have not to fast on while we while we travel? Okay. In so other... this is my first this is my first question. The second question is uh, that for example, suppose if I travel to any city uh, and uh, I have a uh, and I didn't get my accommodation yet, and uh, for example, suppose I am living uh, with my uh, not a friend and some kind of a colleague, do we have to make an answer or we have to pay the full uh, These are my two questions, Shaykh. All right, thank you, Shakir from uh, France. When the Almighty Allah mandated fasting, He said, But if you're traveling and if you're sick, so you have the concession to skip fasting if you're traveling the travel distance. In this case of Ramadan, you have the choice based on your capacity. You feel like anyway, I don't eat in the plane. And it's not really like a troublesome, I can fast, then it's better to fast. But if you decided to break your fast, you enjoy the concession, you're perfectly fine and there is no blame upon you. But you gotta make it up, inshallah, after Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Romy from the USA, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one is when omen in a monthly uh, cycle, at that time, if any major sin happen, how she can uh, repent for that major sin. Mm. And my second question is, when um, um, and a husband and a wife um, have any issue um, for like, uh, suppose his husband is uh, angry on the wife for any reason or anything like that, at that time, can any nafal, like a fasting or voluntary fasting or prayer uh, will be acceptable or at that time only the first thing um, um, omen needs to be done? Okay, Those well, uh, sister, sister Rumi, I didn't get your second question yes. clearly. The second, second question is about like a husband and a wife related is if any argument happen and husband is um, angry on wife, can wife still continue her nafal uh, prayer and the voluntary fasting, like Monday, Thursday fasting? Those things, are those things will be still acceptable or she needs to do only the first thing? Okay. Until her husband get happy on her. All right. Thank you, Sister uh, Rumi from the USA. Shakir from France. Uh, once I land, I stay with a friend or some people, and uh, I'm not sure how many days, but I'm staying for a long time. When do I get to uh, pray short, qasr salah short in my prayer, or pray full? Well, it, it, the, the place in which you're staying, whether it's a house or a hotel or a motel, does not determine the qasr or shortening in the prayer. 
what determines whether you are eligible for shortening the prayer and combining two prayers at the time of either one of them or not is the period. So I landed to France. I'm in Paris. I'm going to be staying in Paris from day one. I booked a round trip, uh, trip ticket or one way ticket and I know that I'm going to stay here for a month or for two. So from day one I pray full. Why? Because I already decided Iqama residency for more than four days. So the vast majority of the scholars are of the view that if you know that you're going to be staying more than four days, then you start praying full from the first day. The, the idea of keep shortening the prayer, even if it is beyond four days, beyond ten days, beyond a month and two, is concerning somebody who is Musafir, traveling, hasn't decided yet, when am I going back? Uh, I have a mission. I haven't finished it. But every day I think, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a couple of days. So I haven't decided. As long as you have not decided, then you keep shortening the prayer. Even if it goes beyond the four days. Even if it is beyond a month. But if I know from the beginning, that mashallah, this is my round trip ticket. And uh, I, I got a new job. I will be staying here. But for the time being, I'm staying in a hotel until I find a flat. All of that removes a concession of shortening the prayer because you have landed to a place in which you intend to stay more than four days. Uh, Sister Rumi from the USA had two questions. The first question is, uh, how can a woman make tawbah even for a major sin while she's having her menses? Oh, well, to answer this question, I need to remind you when a woman is having her menses, she is not impure. A woman cannot pray, true, due to the menses, the monthly cycle. And she cannot fast, but she is not impure. In a sense, when the Prophet ﷺ asked for something from Aisha, she said, uh, hand it over to me. She said, well, I'm, I'm having the period. I said, well, the period is not in your hand. It's okay. And the Prophet وسلم, as Ummu Salama narrated that uh, I once experienced my period. So I slipped away uh, from the bed of the Prophet وسلم. He said, oh, what happened? You must have started your period. Come on over. And the Prophet وسلم, would cuddle with her, sleep next to her on the same bed. And Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet وسلم, would eat with me while I'm having the menses. And he will let me drink from the glass, from the cup, from, uh, you know, the bowl. And then after I finish drinking, he will revolve it so that he will put his lips on the same spot where I drank from and he will drink after me. He will give me a piece of meat to eat. I will take a bite. Then he will take it and take a bite from the same spot. What is this exactly? Love, affection, compassion. Right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ is very passionate. And also to confirm that the wife is not najis. Because at that time, the Jews in Medina were of the understanding that she is impure, to be avoided. They wouldn't even let her cook. She wouldn't share bed. Why? Because she's having the period. No, no, no. The period is only in one orifice. But due to the bleeding, you don't pray, you don't uh, fast, you don't have sexual relations. But besides that, the foreplay, kissing and hugging and enjoying the upper part, all of that is halal. But Sheikh, I was asking about tawbah while having the menses. And I'm answering every sister to understand that whenever you're having the menses, it doesn't put you as inferior as a, as a second hand uh, or as an inferior human being. You're a full human being. In Ramadan, in Hajj, in the last 10 nights and days of Ramadan, I cannot pray uh, the night prayer. I cannot fast. You feel sorry. I missed up. No, you didn't miss up. Don't you have an access to make zikr? Don't you have an access to praise Allah? Don't you have an access to say uh, the send the salutation upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Don't you have an access to revise the Quran if you have memorized it? You do have an access to all of that. You're a full believer, and you have full access to do a lot of things. 
Likewise, when one commits a sin, whether minor or major, and she wants to repent, repentance is observed by multiple ways. Repentance can be observed verbally by saying, Astaghfirullah al wa atubu ilayh. Or talking to Allah and saying, Oh Allah, I repent unto you. So accept my repentance. Pardon me and give me forgiveness. That's one way. The second is obviously no repentance while the person is still consistent on doing the sin. So you cease. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib narrated a hadith from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an that he said the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said whoever commits a sin then follows the sin by making perfect wudu and praying two rakahs with full khushu'ah then the sin will be as if it did not take place Allahu Akbar great but too bad I'm having the period I cannot do that yes you cannot pray but you can make tawbah by the tongue sincerely by the tongue this is really important to understand assalamu alaikum canon from albania assalamu alaikum sheikh wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh canon welcome to the program okay sheikh i uh i will catch when uh when allah says in the quran that do not do not backbite each other is he referring to all the humans or just the believers okay this is my question yes it refers to all humans, Akhi. It refers to all humans. Okay. L let me go back to uh, Rumi's second question. When the husband is angry or a husband and wife are having discord, uh, can a woman still pray the nawafil? Uh, or she should only pray the fard? And she cannot pray the nawafil and fast nafila, voluntary fasting, as long as the husband is upset with her. We need to blow up this concept of if the husband is upset, then my worship is not accepted. Because it all depends on whose error is it. So there are a lot of sisters in the marriage counseling, I feel that she's living with a monster. She's super nice and he's super evil. So if he's upset, uh, go to hell. You know, it's his fault. And in the UK, sometimes in the marriage counseling, when I meet with the sister and she keeps complaining, I assume that she's kind of exaggerating. Then when it is the husband's turn, I say, is that right? He says, I acknowledge all what she says. I know I'm really bad, I'm terrible. I'm trying to quit, I'm but, you know, but she's a nice person and I know she will forgive me. So he admits all what she said. And she's very eloquent, she's very quiet, she's trying to even to conceal, she doesn't want to speak all the way. So now if the husband is upset with her, uh, would the angels curse her? Would uh, her prayer not be accepted? Of course not. We're talking about when it is her fault, then she must take the initiative and ask him to pardon her. And Allah will be pleased with her. But as far as the prayer, whether who's upset and who's not upset, the prayer is accepted. Faridah, mandatory prayers, mandatory fasting, or even voluntary. As a matter of fact, one of the best means of soothing down things and calming down things and improving your relationship with your spouse will be through, you know, offering some prayers. And uh, with regards to the voluntary fasting, the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in general, a woman whose husband is present, he is not out of town. Before fasting, a voluntary fasting, uh, you need to inform him. Or if you guys are on the same page and he understands that Mondays and Thursdays you're fasting, he doesn't mind, he gives you like a, 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 an open uh, permission. He, he likes it, alhamdulillah, shukla. But we're talking about a couple. The husband is young, the woman is young, they're recently married. MashaAllah, the sister is fasting every other day. She's got a very strong iman, but the guy is very weak. He's a doctor, he goes to the hospital, a lot of nurses falling around, or a lot of colleagues, a lot of patients, female, and he's weak. I don't blame him. So he comes home and he says, honey, 
And he's trying to kiss her, hug her, and some folk play. She said, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, I'm fasting. Uh, okay, I'm going back to the hospital, or I'm going back to the clinic. Now the Prophet Wasallam, he's not giving the man a control like he's having a chain around your neck, but he is looking at the bigger picture to maintain the welfare of the entire community, not only one person. Your fasting is a voluntary fasting. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I receive a guest, I'm a man, if I receive a guest, uh, and it's voluntary fasting, break your fast in order to honor your guest and eat with him, right? Unless if he says it's okay. If you're married, if you're a married woman, if you're a man and you're married, and your wife invites you for bed, and this is a voluntary fasting, break your fast, and satisfy her wish and her desire. This is what I'm trying to convey. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Umm Kulthum from the UK. Wa alaikum assalam, how are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, and thank you for asking. Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask, um, I have a um, um, constipation problem. So sometimes when I pray, I need to make udu three, four, five times. And, uh, and also, uh, can I, uh, if I have a problem like this, can I do uh, one time like a, a tasbih of a ruku tasbih? Okay, and, uh, well, well I, I got really confused. What, what is the diagnosis or the problem that you're having in the first place? Uh, con constipation. Constipation, okay. Yes. So, you make two so and like three wudu. Uh, maybe for sometime four or five, why? sometime one time why? like this. Why, why? Sorry? Why do you have to make three or four or five times wudu? Because I keep uh, break my wudu, that's why. Okay, so it's not m maybe due to constipation or due to flatulence, you're having uh, gas incontinence. So you keep breaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the person keeps breaking wind or gas. Okay, and this yeah, is on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this is on constant basis, not occasionally, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, make one wudu. When you hear that then, or whenever it is time for the prayer, make one wudu and immediately after the, the wudu, you can pray. But Sheikh, you know, in the prayer, I feel like I broke wind. That's okay, because that is incontinence. You cannot control it. It is happening all the time. You just live with it. It's out of your control. So by analogy to urine incontinence or salasul bowel, you can simply make wudu whenever it is the prayer time. That is the condition. You don't make wudu before the prayer time. Or if you're going for tawaf, umrah, or hajj at the hotel room, you make wudu, and you're going to the haram. On the way, oh my God, broke wind once, twice, three times, four times, it doesn't matter. I lost count, it doesn't matter. Go ahead and make tawaf. Even while I'm making tawaf, I'm breaking wind. It's okay. The guy who's ripping urine drops while making tawaf, that's called urine incontinence on a regular basis. One wudu is sufficient. But this wudu will be valid for this current prayer, and all its relating nawafil. So the sunnah before, the sunnah after, I've done my tawaf, then I pray the two sunnahs, all the relating nawafil, and the one single fard, prayer or namaz. Okay? Uh, brothers and sisters, it's time to take a short break, and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. Hang around, don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a few minutes, inshallah. intentions today, issues around the heart. How to be a leader, how to understand yourself and others. Community is a diverse group of people. How will you deal with the problems? Charity begins at home, as a proverb would say. How can we make a successful family among ourselves? Communication skills is one of the most important things that you should know. How do we deal with the many conflicts in our lives today? Join us on Huda TV in Youth Matters where we'll talk about different aspects and subjects related to youth and highlight the importance of youth in the development of the Ummah.
وما كنا له مكرمين وإنا إلى ربنا لمنقلبون Abdullah ibn Umar narrated, when the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sat on his camel to go out on a journey, he said, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, three times. Then he said, Subhana lavi, sakhara lana hadha, wa ma kunna lahu mukrineen, wa inna ila rabbina la munkallibun. Glory be to him who has made subservient to us for we had not the strength for it, and to our Lord do we return. Day, the Prophet وسلم, came out to the companions عنهم, and he said to them, Don't you bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and he has no partners? Don't you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? Don't you bear witness that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the companions عنهم, they said, Yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet وسلم, said, فأبشروا. Have the glad tidings, the great news as a result of this. Because the Qur'an has two ends to it. One end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one end in your hands. Then he said to them alayhi salatu wasalam, فَتَمَسَّكُوا بِهِ Hold fast to it because you would never be led astray and you would never be perished if you're holding fast to the book of Allah. Because of that, join us every week in Qur'an in depth where we recite and reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. We go in depth into the verses, following the ways of the Prophet وسلم, and the companions عنهم, when they used to take the verses, one set of verses after another. They would recite it, they would reflect upon the meanings of it, and they would act according to it, and then they would go to the next set of verses. Join us every week in Quran in depth so that we would recite and reflect and learn more about the Book of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our life and to make us among those who follow the Quran and the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I believe our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of your screen for the reference. And uh, once again, I'd like to remind you to share the word by sharing this episode and all our episodes and programs. Also subscribe to the YouTube channel which should appear on the bottom of the screen, insha'Allah. Uh, Tahira Anjum says in her question just right now assalamu alaikum my grandfather is blind and very weak he doesn't pray as he says that he he has urine leakage and he gets impure quite often and he says that allah will forgive him i try to remind him all the time but he gets angry when i tell him what should i do i don't want him to leave this world why he doesn't pray very good question inshallah will answer it after this call assalamu alaikum Muhammad from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Sheikh, I really appreciate that you are doing a good job, that you are, uh, you know, answering uh, many, many, many questions. And uh, let Allah bless you and your family Amen. and the whole Ummah, Sheikh. Ameen. 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 Thank you. May Allah accept, Akhi Muhammad. Go ahead. Ameen. Sheikh, I have one question. In uh, in uh, some Middle Eastern countries, you know, Middle Eastern parts, there is a culture of marriage called pleasure marriage uh, that they will have a contract for one uh, one hour, two hours, or even one month, two months. Uh, and that is uh, quite prevalent in uh, the Middle Eastern countries. So I just want to know, Sheikh, what is the Islamic point of view about that? 
Okay, a temporary marriage, even if it is concluded in a contract where a person marries for a limited period of time, this is a full act of adultery and it is not recognized in Islam uh, and there is a general consensus in this regard. A marriage which is limited to time is an adultery. It is not a marriage, even if it fulfills the consent of the guardian, the dowry and the witnesses. But this marriage, if it is limited to a fixed period of time is not acceptable and it is perceived as fornication. Uh, Idris from Pakistan, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum, Idris. Assalamu Alaikum, Ya Sheikh. Wa Alaikum, Assalamu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing great. I hope you're doing great as well. Uh, thank you, thank you. Basically, I had uh, two questions, yeah, Sheikh. Go ahead. Uh, my first question was, uh, when I miss my first uh, prayer, uh, which is obligatory pr prayer, uh, like uh, deliberately or not deliberately, uh, what is the solution? Uh, what to do next? Uh, are we supposed to do a qaza prayer? Uh, or uh, when it's gone, it's gone. Uh, you don't have any choice to do anything else. Okay. And my second question was, uh, uh, this uh, year I was uh, blessed to do Umrah and uh, people in the in front of Kaaba they were uh, drinking the water which was uh, uh, coming from the rain on the top of the Kaaba they were uh, gathering it uh, with a bottle and drinking it uh, I, I wanted to know what uh, that is that anything uh, to do with Islam or not thank okay. you okay uh, thank you Akhi Idris from Pakistan in the sound hadith which was collected by Imam Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man nama an salatin aw nasiyaha, fal yusalliha mata dhakaraha, la kafarata laha illa dhalik. And this hadith means, if you happen to oversleep or forget a prayer or more, then once you wake up or once you remember it, you should make it up immediately. And making up the prayer should be observed in the same order. Zuhr before Asr, Asr before Maghrib, Maghrib before Isha, and so on. There is no other ransom for it. There is no other expiation. So you don't say, oh my God, yesterday I forgot Asr. It's over. No, it's not over. Even if it was last year, you still make it up. Okay? This is in case that you've done it out of forgetfulness or you overslept. Then if the person did not do it deliberately, that is more worthy in addition to making sincere tawbah and begging Allah for forgiveness, skipping a single prayer without a valid reason such as you are asleep, you forgot or you are in the plane and you are going to make it up, incurs the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّ غَيْ is a severe torment in hellfire for those from Bani Israel who skipped the prayers and they did not pray on time, they prayed on and off. So if any person have missed any prayer, you should make it up as soon as you remember or as soon as you repent, insha'Allah. Uh, Sister Um Sana from the KSA, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Alhamdulillah and thank you for asking Sister Um Sana. Uh, I have only one question. Yes. Uh, there is a practice uh, back in our country that uh, all the wedding invitations, they have uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim written in Arabic. And uh, some of them even further have some verses of the Quran. So this uh, wedding invitations after the wedding is over, uh, how do we discard it? Because they have the names of Allah and okay. they have the ayah of Quran. Okay, my question. Thank, thank you. you. So whenever you have papers or newspapers or old books or invitation cards or something that has the name of Allah or a card that has a wish and a hadith or an ayah, you discard it by burning it or uh, I used to have a shredder, a cross shredder, which will cross uh, shred the paper into fine pieces that doesn't have a single word. So either this or that. Normally we collect all the papers which may have the name of Allah or an ayah or a hadith. Like unfortunately, 
uh, the newspaper in most Muslim countries which have ayat and ahadith and then they are thrown in the streets. So when I'm walking here and there, I want to find you collect them and then in a batter you can burn all those papers. Okay? Barakallahu feeki. Tahira Anjum. You just heard my answer to Brother Idris from Pakistan about uh, skipping the prayers. In fact, there is no excuse for a living and a conscious person to leave the prayer. The only excuse is for women during their menses. But if the person is lying down on his or her deathbed, but they breathe, they are conscious, they are in pain, but they know that they know what is going on around them, then they must pray. Ajib. Very amazing. But how? When the Prophet ﷺ said you should pray while standing, but if you can't sit down, if you can't lie down, if you can't by just moving your eyelids. So uh, do you think that being blind, you're the only person who's blind? No, Abdullah ibn Abbas lost his eyesight by the end of his life. Tarjuman al-Quran. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was the more adhan. He used to call adhan. He used to call adhan. For the Prophet وسلم, along with Bilal, Bilal would call the first Adhan and Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum would call the second Adhan in Fajr. Okay? And Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was uh, ordered by the Prophet even to go to the Masjid to attend the prayer. Being blind doesn't mean that you're blind, you eat, you drink. So yes, keep uh, reminding him. And I'm going to give him um, a good advice, inshallah. Because he said that he has urine leakage, yani, uh, incontinence. So in this case, make wudu for dhuhr, when the adhan is called. And with this wudu, you pray dhuhr, and right away you pray asr. So you combine asr along with dhuhr. But he's not musafir, Sheikh. I know he's not musafir, brothers and sisters. But he's sick. He's eligible. I tell my mother. I know that she's, you know, she's insisting, no, I need to pray on time, every prayer. I said, but you have the concession. When wudu, you pray dhuhr and as, alhamdulillah, you're done with the two prayers. When wudu, you pray maghrib and isha, by the end of the day, either at the time of isha or at the time of fajr. Then in the morning, mashallah, you make wudu for fajr. So how many times? Three wudus. Look, Allah give you ease. But Shaykh, I don't have anyone to give me wudu. You mean that no one is around you at all? If you don't have anyone, make tayammum. Bismillah. Bismillah. That is tayammum. And then pray. How is that? La of ease. La of ease. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma'al usri yusra. Fa inna ma'al usri yusra. Inna ma'al usri yusra. And al-mashakkatu tajlibu tayseer. This is a principle, golden principle in fiqh. And the principles of jurisprudence that whenever there is hardship, immediately ease is delivered. May Allah guide him and us and all of us to what is best. Just remind him that inshallah when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is one of those whom Allah gave him the glad tidings. The Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, the Almighty Allah says, what will be the reward of a person, of a servant of mine whom I've taken Habibatayhi, his eyesight, other than entering paradise? So say, Grandpa, you're going straight to heaven. Do not ruin that. For losing your eyesight and being patient, you go straight to heaven because you're Muslim. You believe in Allah, you endure that patiently. Somebody else didn't endure that patiently. Oh, okay, you're not going to paradise, but you're not getting your sight back. So be patient. Ask Allah for shifa, for cure, for help. Allah will make things easy for you. The Almighty Allah says, if He takes your eyesight, He's the one who took your eyesight. Why? He wants to give you something better, something bigger. Soon you will die and you go straight to heaven, as the Almighty Allah said in, uh, in the hadith. Um, yeah, we have Pal uh, Washa uh, Kazi and also. Um, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There's a long question from Agira Ferdos. Uh, I'll just jump into your question. I have a question you have as a Muslim, an unbelieving friend, and will die, then leave some money 
for you as a Muslim? Is it permitted for you to take it? Well, if you're given this as a gift from a non-Muslim in his life or, his, uh, or after his death, he wrote a will and says this is a gift for you, enjoy it. No problem. If a non-Muslim invites you for dinner, is it halal to accept the invitation and eat? If the food is halal, yes. And the Prophet ate from the sheep which was given to him by dinner, a feast given to him by a Jewish family, right? So if he gives you this, you know, in the case of the inheritance, inheritance, we know that the vast majority of the scholars, there is no inheritance between a Muslim and non-Muslim. But if the person who died said that, you know, he gave you in his life or wrote you a check, so you catch it after his death, it's not inheritance, it's a gift. Is it permissible to use it? Yes, it's permissible to use it. Let me wrap it up with the Palwasha Kazi, who says, I'm an artist, uh, I do painting, but I always try not to paint humans. People, uh, or people just because it says it's prohibited in Islam, I want to know if it is really uh, prohibited. Yes. Number one, there is a general consensus among all the scholars of the Ummah that if the painting of, of the drawing is with the dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, or projections, so it has a body, then this is agreed upon. All the scholars of the Ummah say this is haram. So carving a statue of a human being or of an animal in Islam is not permissible. Okay? But the painting, the vast majority of the scholars are of the view that painting is likewise. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was asked by somebody who says, I like to draw and I like to paint. So he said, Urnu minhi, come, come, come close. And then he reminded him what the, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that a painter who draws living creatures, human beings or uh, animals, it will be said to him on the day of judgment, so why don't you breathe the soul into it, make it alive. If you were able to uh, draw and imitate the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he advised him that the nature is full of things, other human beings to paint and to draw. And I think that so should be sufficient because we ran out of time. Uh, brothers and sisters, I pray for your health, wealth, and the best of Iman and the best of return. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. May Allah grant us all forgiveness. Uh, one very prominent Sheikh passed away today in Egypt. So I want you to pray for him. May Allah have mercy on his soul. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Your